Uh, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Talent Finders podcast. Today, I'd like to introduce you to award-winning author, entrepreneur, and former uh, food uh, director um, at Real Simple Magazine, uh, Sarah Copeland. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here, Karen. Uh, so I first met uh, Sarah more than 10 years ago um, on Sarah's first visit uh, to South Africa for a charity event. Um, Sarah, as an award-winning author, can you please share with us um, how your career started and your passion for food? And did you know from early on that this was something that you wanted to do? Yes, well, Karen, I actually studied journalism in, in university. And so I actually came to New York City to write and do photography. And as soon as I came here, I was deeply immersed in the culture of New York City and just loved the vibrancy. Um, and a lot of that was, you know, the magazine industry, which I worked immediately right out of college. I started working at Glamour Magazine and then Oprah Magazine. But wow. a lot of that was the environment around me. So after work as a young professional in my, you know, early 20s, after work, we would work quite late. And then sometimes we would go to these two and three hour dinners um, and sort of treat ourselves because we would work these long days and work really hard and, and for fairly uh, low income at the time. But the way that we treated ourselves um, was to, you know, every few weeks to go out to a really nice restaurant and um, just really experience the culture of the restaurant scene in New York City. And that wasn't totally new to me. My parents, um, we grew up in a medium sized town about an hour and a half away from Chicago. Yeah. And we didn't have fancy restaurants really in our town, but maybe once or twice a year, my dad would really do his research and take us to downtown Chicago and try to treat us to a really special meal. And I recognized that food was, was both the sustenance and joy of the family table, which was always kind of the base, basis for me and still is, but that it was also an art. You know, my dad exposed me to the idea that it's art and it's theater and being in a restaurant is something special you know that you dress up and you behave a certain way right. and um you know and that really really felt very special to me from the time that i did it with my family and especially seeing the joy my dad would take in like a perfectly pureed mashed potato um and he's a very emphatic eater he would say oh oh my 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 this is just delicious you know, and, <laughs> wow. and when you see that as a child and you experience that joy and you think, wow, this is something worth paying attention to, just as if he, you know, when he took us to the Nutcracker Ballet and, you know, really fussed and got us, you know, good seats and um, insisted that we sit through it even when we were tiny and we yeah. saw the, the joy that that brings you. So I, I learned very early on that it's an art, but I don't think I really put that together until I moved to New York City and started seeing the attention that all New Yorkers pay yes. to food and restaurants. Wow, it's that's just something amazing. of the culture here. Yes, for sure. It's an amazing city, for sure. Right. And so before that, I never would have considered it a career. I just considered it something to enjoy as you know a, a, a bystander or, or on the experiential end but when I saw that I was so drawn to the visual end of food and the way I approach photography and writing wanting to know more wanting to get the best story wanting to have the most beautiful photo and started applying that to food I, I became curious in a way that just eating out at the restaurants and knowing the good restaurants wasn't enough for me I wanted to know how to make that kind of food so that's when I decided to go to culinary school Wow, amazing. So your three cookbooks, um, um, firstly, you started with the, the Newlywed, followed by Feast and your current launch um, of Every Day is a Saturday. What is the meaning and motivation behind each cookbook? That's such a great question. Well, each of my books has really paralleled what, what's going on in my own personal life. So when I first met my husband, Andrash, he and I were... Um, when we were first married, I had started a blog and, you know, it was, it was a blog that I think maybe like 10 people read. It wasn't a, one of these big, big blog. very well-known blogs, but, um, but I just wanted to keep, I had always, I had been working in food at that point for quite a while. And I'd been working at the Food Network and other places and had done private chefing in Saint-Tropez. But, um, but we had come back to live in New York City and live together as husband and wife. And I was writing a bit about that. And when I met my editor, he said, I love the way you write about how much you care for your husband and how much you care wow. for 
the family table that you two are creating. Um, and he actually came to me, my editor came to me with the idea of the newlywed cookbook. And to be honest, at first I thought, well, that sounds a little, um, like light for me or like a little fluffy. Yes. But when I, uh, when I really got to thinking about how important I did feel it was to build your life around the table and there was a really meaningful message there, then I embraced it. Um, and I saw that his parents, his parents had been married for, um, when we got married, uh, our parents had both just celebrated their 40th anniversaries. And now they wow. now we've been married 10 years. So each of our parents have been married for 50 years. And we, we kind of acknowledge that they, they really keep the family life sacred, you know, the time together around the table. And so that book was really an expression of caring for someone you love. It doesn't have to be your spouse, but the, but the person that you've chosen to sp spend your life with, whoever that may be, and that applies yes. to any kind of love. Um, but, but really nurturing that relationship through food. And my second book, Feast, is a, is a vegetarian cookbook. My husband is a longtime vegetarian. He's been a vegetarian for 20 years. Wow. And I was not when we met. Um, and it really was a great challenge for me to try to learn to cook. He's a big guy. He's an athlete. Um, he's very active. And so to try to, you know, I was fine to just eat cheese and salad for dinner, but that wasn't going to work for no. <laughs> the rest of our lives. So, um, and then as, especially once children came on the scene, it, Feast was an opportunity for me to challenge myself. How do you cook vegetarian day in and day out for weeks and months and years and still make sure that you, your, your spouse, your children, and your guests who come into your home feel satisfied? Yes. Especially for me, having the reputation of, of oh, you've been a private chef in San Tropez, you've worked in French restaurants in New York City. You know, when someone comes to your home, they have high expectations. Yes. <laughs> so you can't just put out a cheese board every time. You know, you have to. You have to create these beautiful meals. Um, so I I'm super proud of Feast because that, that really pushed me and challenged me. Uh, and then my newest cookbook, Everyday Saturday, again, came from my real life. I was working as, a, uh, as the food director at Real Simple Magazine. Um, we had, a, at the time, a two-year-old. And for the first time in many years, I was working in an office in Manhattan, commuting from our home in Long Island City, which was only like 30 minutes. But... By the time you add, you know, dropping a child off at school and picking them up and bath time and, and all the routines of, of a busy family life, there's real emotive, delicious cooking was being squeezed out. Yes. And that was very ironic because my job was to teach the women of the magazine, the, the audience of the magazine, the, the three million women who got it every day or every month, how to cook for their families. But then in my yes. own family, it was getting squeezed out. Um, and so I really leaned into the weekend. I really looked to the weekend to cook these big, beautiful meals to, to nourish myself and my emotions and my soul at the stove um, and take my family along for that ride. So now, you know, every single weekend and often during the weekdays too, but you know, now, now that I have two children, we spend a lot of time on the weekends at the stove. The kids are up on the countertop. We're making a ragu or a Sunday sauce or, um, you know, a beautiful pot of carrot soup. And we're tucking away things for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so that we're not going to have that rush that we used to have in, the, yes, uh, of course. in that time period where we come home and the mealtime is a little bit more um, gracious feeling, you know, a little bit more time for laughter and really enjoying the food and not feeling like, okay, chip chop, kids, time to get yeah. up for the bath, you know? Yeah. And an appreciation. Right. Right. Yeah. Sure. And I think appreciation comes from number one, cooking with love and not out of a feeling of duty, but out yes. of a feeling of love. Like if I'm getting to the place where the cooking is feeling like duty, the number one thing I have to do is take me and the kids out for dinner. Yes. And it's a luxury, obviously we can't always afford, but um, it resets me to a place of now I'm getting nourished by somebody else. Somebody else made this beautiful meal. I'm getting to just sit and relax and enjoy it. Yeah. On the other side, and then it kind of restores my ability to give and give and give to the family and our friends. Amazing. So that leads me to the next question. Um, so you've had some incredible opportunities within your career, um, appearing on the Food Network and on Martha Stewart's show. Um, how did uh, these opportunities come about? Well, the Food Network was interesting. I I actually wasn't a big food TV watcher, um, but I had just 
come back from two summers as a private chef in Saint Tropez. And so since that was seasonal work, I'd, I'd come out of restaurants, gone to work as a private chef in Saint Tropez, this beautiful villa, but only for the summers. And then I would come hey. back in September and have to find immediate work. And so I had a, I think I had a friend that worked at the Food Network and I reached out to the head chef there and just started freelancing there on the television shows. And then that just grew and grew. So I ended up spending seven years at the Food Network doing um, food styling at first. I worked on Iron Chef, which was super fun. And eventually I ended up in the test kitchen developing recipes for the Food Network cookbooks and developing the Food Network magazine with the initial launch team. That was super fun. Wow. And the Martha Stewart Show opportunity came because in my first book, The Newlywed Cookbook, I had, it was before Instagram and these kind of viral recipes. But if you would kind of equate it to a, an earlier version of a viral recipe, yeah. I had a recipe called the Thousand Layer Chocolate Chip Cookies that everyone just latched right onto from that book. And they're still, I still stand by them as a totally exceptional recipe. They're a lot of effort, but they're amazing. Yeah. And these super layered chocolate chip cookies that I make sort of like puff pastry, I layer in chocolate and then layer in dough and layer in chocolate so you get wow. the marbled effect and um and so martha stewart had uh someone in her kitchen make them and she tasted them and then she made them at home and she told me she loved them and so she asked me to come on the show and teach her audience how to cook them that was super fun my mom was in town Martha was like, oh, do you want your mom to come out on stage? And I was like, absolutely. My mom, wow. <laughs> my mom and I both got hair and makeup done, you know, from the, the Martha Stewart team. And they were like the best makeup artist ever. Um, and then we just had such a fun day. We spent all day feeling all glammed up in our pretty hair and makeup. And, and then I, I think at the end of that day, I just had to go pick up my daughter from school. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and all my fancy, all the fancy effort. And then, you know, usually people say, go out to dinner when you're dressed up like that. But we just had to pick up my daughter and go home and make dinner. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, that's an amazing experience. It really was. It was so much fun. So what would you say uh, some of your biggest uh, lessons and learnings have been? And what would you say um, some of your biggest career highlights have been to date? Uh, I think one of the biggest lessons and learnings I've been I've been hanging on to lately is knowing when to say yes and when to say no because oh. by nature and, and you know when you're a young person starting out in your career the advice and my nature was always say yes just say yes to everything and I did I said yes to absolutely everything I tried everything I worked super hard I if someone needed extra help if it was like extra credit working late working weekends I did it um but then as you have a family and you get further along in your career, the actually more important thing becomes learning when to say no. And that's very, very hard for me yeah. um, because I don't want to let anyone down or disappoint anyone or, um, you know, I think some people are coming from a place of fear. Like, you know, as a, as an entrepreneur, if you say no, maybe those opportunities will come by. I have a really strong faith, so I don't really buy into that. I always feel like opportunities will be there. And God has always provided for me and my family. Um, but I do feel more beholden to other people's expectation of me and their feelings about, you know, what I'm capable to do to help them. So learning to say no has been a super big challenge, but a very important lesson for me, um, especially as my time is just stretched more and more thin and wanting to be a very engaged mother um, and, and do my very, very best at all the work that I tackle. Yeah, no, that's a, it's very important and also like about being selective because I think uh, women in general as well tend to just say yes to everything. Right. feel like you're going to miss, like you said, an opportunity or something, but sometimes you actually end up doing a disservice to yourself because, right. you know, you're not giving the time to other things that could be, you know, um, actually helping you or your career to be able to help give back on a bigger level. So I completely understand. <laughs> right. And, um, and as for the biggest career highlights, that's such a good question. I think one of them happened very recently. I've been in a lot of different magazines um, over the years from, you know, Martha Stewart living to whole living when that magazine existed and um, food and wine, Sever, all of them, Better Homes and Gardens and Rachel Ray, but two that were really, really meaningful to me um, was 
Food and Wine did a story about me and my husband's life in Hungary. My husband's Hungarian and we have a small property there that we are developing that we eventually want to be able to invite guests over to experience Hungarian culture. And so years ago, Food and Wine did a story with us in Hungary and that was a total thrill. Wow. Um, and then another one was that Domino Magazine and it's one of my favorite magazines. I just think they really embody like the female experience so well. And in their spring 2019 issue, their current issue, which is the color issue, they featured a story about um, Feed Supper, which is a non-for-profit um, fundraiser that I've been doing for the last five years that's really near and dear to my heart. And so they came up to, to Upstate and featured a story about our Feed Supper this year. And that just felt so gratifying because it's something that I've done for so many years just for the pure give back experience to be able to give um, and help with the food insecurity that we have in our country and in Africa, because as you, as we, we spoke about, you and I met 10 years ago when I was going to South Africa and that place never left my heart. And so um, when I started working with Feed Foundation, we actually, all the money we were giving, a lot of it was going to different African nations, but um, including South Africa. But now they have changed their focus to, um, issues of, of hunger here in the United States. And so some of the feed suppers that I did the first three years, all the money went, we get, we got to choose different countries. And a couple of years ago, we chose Ghana. So we had a Ghana themed dinner and we cooked some Ghanese food and then all the proceeds went to Ghana. And this year we did an upstate dinner and all the proceeds went right here within our own community in New York state um, to help with hunger issues. And that, and that was featured in Domino. And that just felt like a really big, special moment for me like okay I feel it was just like a, a small thank you um mm. and also it's so important because then when people see that you can do this mm. th I think that it inspires them to say well maybe I can do that and that's ultimately my goal yeah for other people to say well you know I mean we're all special she's not any more special than I am I can do that um, and inspire people to want to challenge themselves, whether it's in their career or in their family life or in their philanthropic life, to do more than they thought they could. Yeah, no, that's amazing. So that leads me to the next question. Um, so as a mom of two beautiful children, feeding your children the right nutrition is vitally important. Uh, there is a big issue today with food and what goes into food. Um, is part of your goal uh, education and guiding people to watch what they eat and how and how do you do this um, and are you involved in any programs yes that is definitely one of my big goals so a few years after culinary school um, I really got the drive and the desire to add another layer to it so I went and did a holistic healthcare nutrition program it was with at the time Columbia University and I what we did is we studied all these different types of diets from the Mediterranean diet to like fad diets like Adkins diet or paleo or whatever. Um, but we really looked at, you know, raw food and veganism and vegetarianism and, and studied kind of nutrition in a more holistic way, how it affects your mind, body, emotions. Um, I learned at a very young age that what I eat really affects my mood and my emotions and how I feel about myself. Uh, I remember being in first or second grade and having a lot of the kids complaining in school about being you know having headaches or being tired and my teacher was she was very smart she was wise beyond her years because people weren't really talking about the mind-body connection back then yeah. and she pulled me out and she said Sarah you never complain I want to hear what your mother feeds you for breakfast in the morning and I was like a little bit embarrassed because <laughs> Um, you know, I was a little chunky little kid, you know, and I thought, oh my gosh, she, she thinks I eat too much. Like, of course, you know, your natural reaction sometimes when you're singled out is to like get flush and think that you're, you did something wrong. Mm. I said, well, we have eggs every morning and fresh fruit. Um, you know, but we always have eggs. And she was like, I want you all to eat eggs and fresh fruit for the rest of the week. No more complaining. And then just kind of moved on. But what she was, you know, she paid me this and my family this great compliment, which was, you know, that I was able to focus and be present in the classroom because of what my mother fed us every morning. Mm -hmm. And that connection, having that connection made for me at age seven 
has never left me. And that's always just been a huge part of my mission. So both what we feed children in schools, like I started a school garden program when I worked at the Food Network, working closely with Share Our Strength and the Feed Foundation. And we built 17 school gardens across the country in underserved communities. And the message is, you know, that everyone deserves access to fresh food. And, and that what we feed our children, especially, but also adults, but especially children who are growing and learning and, and have so much change going on in their body, affects how they behave and how they learn and their capabilities in this world so much. Yeah, and concentration. Right, concentration. And so yeah. the word you use, vitally important, it could not be more true. And I think we, it's easy to brush it aside. Yeah. So, Earlier in my career, I think I made the mistake of being very dogmatic about it. Like, this is good and this is bad. You know, fruits and vegetables um, are good and sugar and treats are bad. And that's very alienating. I, I, I alienated, you know, grandparents who love to feed their children, you know, their grandchildren sweets or certain types of cultures where they just are really focused around pastries or, um, you know, it, it can be, or or even children can offend other children if they're like, oh, I can't eat that. That's bad, you know, for a child if they have an Oreo in their lunchbox. You know, I don't want my children to say that to another child and make that child feel bad about themselves. So I think the focus for me is really about making food joyful and making it fresh and nourishing. And so that you're more, you're so drawn to the good stuff that you crowd out the bad stuff. Yes. You're not, you're not saying what's bad and good and what you should and shouldn't eat, but you're just so drawn to whole plants and fresh vibrant colors on your plate and things that make you feel good um and we all know how we feel when we eat sugar it tastes great for a few minutes and yes. you know, already, <laughs> or everybody's crabby and you know has a headache so yeah um, i think the message for me is just paying attention taking your time around food making it making it a bit sacred there's not a lot sacred left in this world we don't no. we don't like a sacred mentality towards a lot of things that used to be sacred, you know, um, faith or family meal time or the family unit, you know? And so for me, keeping certain things sacred is just, it's so important for the way we move forward as a humanity. Absolutely. So that leads me to the next question. Um, as a woman, um, as a woman, uh, when you started out in your career, do you feel that the support in the food industry has changed or do you think there's still a long way to go in a very competitive industry? You know, that's such a good question. I mean, I'm in a niche of the food industry. Now, when I was in the restaurant world, I absolutely felt like the minority. And I, for example, at the end, the last restaurant I worked in um, was Cafe Baloo and it was really hot restaurant at the time. It had just received three stars from the New York Times and a Michelin star. And the chef, Andrew Carmelini, had just been named best new chef on the cover of Food & Wine magazine. And he was very young. And the whole kitchen was pretty much male. And yeah. the three females that worked there was me and Gaia, who was the pastry chef, and Jen, who was a pastry chef. And then there was one woman who worked on the line and it was kind of a big deal that she worked on the line. She was on Tremet, I think, or she did the fish station or something and she yeah. had worked her way up, but the rest of it was very much a boys club. And I learned very early on, like to be able to carry my own 45 pound bag of flour and not ask for help. And like, just to try to really prove myself that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to ask for special privileges because I was a female. Yeah. Uh, but there, but there was also a definite, you know, awareness that, that I was one of the only females. And it was, it was kind of like the, the elephant in the room that it was like a boys club, you know? Yeah. Um, definitely over the last 15 years, there are so many more female led restaurant kitchens, but in the magazine industry and cookbook author industry, um, most of my colleagues are female. And so there is a lot of support for us in the sense that, you know, there's a lot, I, there's a lot of women I can relate to and say, Oh, how's this going for you? And especially around, Oh, how are you managing this with family life, et cetera. Yes. But two things that have changed that have made it, uh, that have changed a lot in my time. Number one, that in the, um, introduction of Instagram and having our lives completely opened up and on display all the time, I think has created this false sense for most women that we should be able to do everything. 
We can't do everything. And if we can't do everything perfectly and beautifully and gracefully all the time, there's something wrong with us. Yeah. So that's, that I find very dangerous. Um, because- and also people are painting a very, um, you know, everything is like you say, nice and lovely, but you know, behind the scenes, it's a very different scenario. Right. And so I always try in my captions to say like, you know, I, I, when I talk about my family, say like, well, there's dishes in the sink or the kids are a mess or everybody's been up, you know, really telling the true story, whatever's really happening. Yeah. Uh, because the photograph might have been taken while everything was lovely and clean. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then every time I'm interviewed, I always try to share all the people that are helping me. And I, I find so many women I admire up to the point until they don't share how much help they're having. Yeah. And, and then I start to lose my faith in them or my sense of admiration because I know that there's no way they're doing that without help. So I think it's important to say, you know, I have childcare help. Like when I have a photo shoot, I hire a cleaning lady. It's an extravagance for us. It's not, it's not something that we could normally afford to do every day or every week. But if I need to like pr- present my home in the best light for, for a photo shoot, I have someone to come and help me clean it. And so knowing that when I see someone's perfect home on Instagram, I have to know that the children are probably at school and maybe she just cleaned or someone came and helped her clean. And as soon as the kids come home and start to play with their toys again, it's not going to look like that. No. <laughs> so I think it's having the emotional maturity to say, um, or, or being one of the people that's just more honest about it, I think is the most important. Just, just saying, this is what's really happening. Um, here's the help I'm getting. Like, for example, we don't have any grandparents nearby. And so it's a really big struggle to get all my work done. Yes. Even though, even though my children go to school and my son is in childcare, it's still, I still struggle to get it all done in a day. Yes. Um, and then there are women who have their parents living next door and their parents will sweep over and take the kids any old time. And she can hunker down for three and a half days and like finish a deadline. Yes. I don't have anything like that. So no. it's really important. I think that people are just honest about that, that, that I think we could, we could open the doors way wide open and have more that. honest conversations. Right. right? <laughs> exactly. For well, sure. Exactly. So, so what would you say separates you from others in your industry? And what would you say your dream and ultimate vision is for you and your career and your family, of course? Well, I think what separates me is, um, I mean, there are certainly plenty of, of people that come from where I come from in the Midwest and have really strong values um, and integrity. There are certainly many people like that. But I think that I really embody that every day. So I think that my audience knows they can trust me. I don't talk about any products unless I love it, unless I use it, unless I would feed it to my children. Um, I'm really honest about how I got here, that I've had help from my family or, you know, lots of opportunities open to me. Um, I'm, you know, I'm honest about my faith. And I think that that separates me. I mean, I'll be honest that I think if I'm totally being true, sometimes that can help hold me back. I, there have been opportunities that I've had to pass on because of my integrity that right. I know would have made me a lot more money, a lot more famous. Um, and I've intentionally made those choices. And there are times that I look at what other people have and I think that looks so nice and so appealing and so free because there's a lot more, there's more financial freedom or there's more um, you know, support behind them. But ultimately, I sleep really well at night because I feel that I'm totally true to myself and my family and my faith and my community. Yes, and and you have to do what's in alignment with uh, with your values as well. Exactly. So, exactly. Um, and then in terms of my dream and my ultimate vision, I think the thing I'm craving the most right now is to have a studio space. Yes. That <laughs> is separate from my home. Yeah. Um, that. It both gives me a bigger place to dream and kind of spread out my projects and my, and my vision for uh, my books and my storytelling, but also that I can invite people into and give them the experience that you're seeing on Instagram or that you're seeing in my book. I want to be able to share that experience with people firsthand. And so I need a space to do that. So that's my, that's my vision right now. And our project in Hungary is part of that. Um, but also to have something like that here in upstate New York where we live is a really big dream of mine. Wow. No, well, I'm sure you'll achieve it. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much.
working hard towards it right now. <laughs> yeah. So just uh, down to the last two questions. Um, so when writing your cookbooks, what is your process and how do you go about deciding the style of recipes and images? Um, in your books, um, which are so beautifully uh, put uh, together and presented. Um, I'm sure the audience would love to learn more about how your process works and what would be your three key pieces of um, advice to entrepreneurs and those who are looking uh, to get into um, uh, or pursue careers as authors and specialists in food. Okay, so for writing my cookbooks, my process is generally, once I've um, come up with a concept, which like I said, all three of them have just been birthed from my real life and okay. sort of had that feeling, I'll only write a cookbook if I'm like, I have to write this cookbook. Like okay. ideas have come to me or people have brought me ideas, would you like to write this book with me? And if I don't have the feeling of, I must write this cookbook, I, I have so much to say, I've got to get this down on paper, then I won't do it because it's so much work. Yeah. Um, and so once I have that done and I've written my proposal and it's been accepted, the first thing I do is I sit down and I write like the 35 things we're eating constantly at that time in our lives. What it will like, what will I never get tired of making and what, because a book takes about two and a half years to create before it's even out on the market. What will I still want to be eating two and a half years from now? Because if, if something dramatic changes and all of a sudden I'm out there with a new book, but I don't need that food anymore. It would feel very hard for me to go and tell people to go buy the book. Yes. So every day is Saturday. My newest book. One of the things I'm most excited about is that everything in this book, I am cooking from constantly. And in fact, the day that my bound copy book came in the mail, for yeah. my publisher, wow. I was like, thank, you know, thank God, because I've been carrying my huge stapled manuscript into the kitchen because these are the waffles I cook my kids every weekend. This is the banana bread I make twice a week, you know? These are the meatballs that my children love. And it's all in my book. So it's basically like I'm saying, I'm opening my family home to everybody. And so once I write down those recipes, then I can start to say like, well, what are some other things I wanna try? Or what are, where do I wanna push myself? Or what, you know, what's missing? Or maybe we need a few more salads. And so once I have all that down, my next instinct is the visual aspect. So of course I have all the recipe development and testing to do, which takes months and months and months because I'll, I'll test each recipe, I'll write down each recipe, I'll cook it, I'll taste it, I'll give myself feedback and, and change the recipe. And then I'll have myself and a tester, a professional tester come in and I'll have them cook it and I taste theirs. And then I have people at home all over the country. I have a team of like 18 testers who will test everything. And if there's someone at high altitude, there's someone in, you know, Hawaii who can't get the same ingredients as us. You know, there's a friend living overseas. There's tons of people in the Midwest. There's people on the coasts and they're giving me feedback on these recipes. And then I can say, Oh gosh, that ingredient's hard for people to find if they don't live in a big city. So I'm really trying to look at my whole audience. And um, I think what, what I'm good at is delivering a service, a book that, you're going to have a really great experience where you're going to cook the recipes and they will work because they've been tested and tested and tested and they will be delicious and they will look like they look in the book because when I food style, I food style all my own recipes. When I food style, I'm, I'm just making my recipe and then giving it a little extra visual love. Like, you know, maybe I spritz it with water or maybe I drizzle a little extra olive oil, but I'm not changing anything. It is the actual recipe that you see in the book. And, oh, that's amazing. You know, so the reader should be able to make exactly what they're seeing here in the book. And as I'm flipping through, I'm checking myself to make sure that there's nothing that's especially visually challenging. And yeah. really, there's not. You know, it's, it's all very, it's earthy, but beautiful, approachable food. That's amazing. And then, you know, and just uh, the last question, what would be the three key pieces of advice to other entrepreneurs? Um, I think number one, believing in yourself, yes. um, this comes more naturally for me, I think, because my parents were very, uh, amazing and, you know, always said, you can do whatever you want, but you can't do everything you want, no. you can do anything you want, but you can't do everything you want at the same time. Yes. So choose wisely and then just go all in, go for it. You know, they encouraged us to apply for scholarships. They encouraged us to reach for big schools. And I think you have to, if you, if you weren't raised that way, you have to raise yourself that way. You have to be able to look at yourself and say, you can do this. Hey, you, you can do anything you want to do. Yeah. And 
if you're the only one saying it to yourself, then keep saying it to yourself and surround yourself with people who are saying it with you. Yes. Uh, because you have to have unshakable faith in your ability and your drive and your work ethic to be an entrepreneur um, and to write books. It's, it's hard yes. work and there's not a ton of glory. I mean, of course, people are really excited the few weeks and months after the book comes out, um, but then you have to keep going out there and, and standing behind your message. Books don't sell themselves. So, you know, it's, um, it's amazingly hard work, but it's very, very gratifying because I truly believe that when someone gets this book in their home, I truly believe their life will get a little better if they are engaging with the book, using it and following some of the ideas. I really do believe their life will get better. So um, it's gratifying. It's gratifying work. And so I, the, the advice would be unshakable faith in yourself and also um, really, um, sorry, I just lost my last thought. <laughs> That's okay. Um, re oh, really knowing your why. And we hear that a lot, but why are you doing this? And that, yeah. like I said, I, I'm doing this because I know when this gets in there in, in someone's home, it's going to, it's going to inspire and yeah. it's going to push the needle on good living. And so I know that. And so on the hard days and the days that I don't have enough time and I'm stretched too thin or someone, you know, criticizes a piece of my work or whatever, I can look to why I'm doing this. And I'm doing this because I know I can help somebody live mm -hmm. in that rich, beautiful way that I, that I've chosen to live. Um, and so those would be my two pieces of advice. Thank you so much, Sarah. And yeah, it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast with Talent Finders today. And uh, hopefully we can um, interview you in the future and see, uh, see where you're going and how you've progressed. Thank you so much, Karen. It's really an honor and I love chatting with you. This was so much fun. Thank you so much. Speak with you soon. Bye.